Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It is a pleasure to be with you today. Unfortunately, we have a minor technical difficulty. Uh, we will not be sharing our video today, which is unfortunate because we were all actually going to come in as cats. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, welcome to the Underwriters Court. We have an esteemed panel with us here today. Uh, we will do a quick introduction and then some housekeeping, and then we will describe the session format. So let's start with a round of introductions. Hi, sure, thanks. Uh, this is Sandeep Manchanda. Uh, my background includes being CIO, Chief Data Officer, Analytics, analytics Lead, even running a life agency. And, and for the last few years, my focus has been completely the underwriting process. So I look forward to this. Over to you, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer Richards, um, and I am the Chief Underwriting Officer at Bestow Life Insurance Company. Um, Many of you guys know me as JR. I've been working on reinventing underwriting for my entire career, and now I'm having a ton of fun uh, working with the first fully digital insurance startup where absolutely 100% of our business is instant issue. Awesome, and I'm Nicole Myers. I am a very passionate insurance nerd who is always asking the question, how could we do this better? And I'm currently in a role with Swiss Re leading underwriting propositions. Mm -hmm. Jason. Yeah, hi, I'm Jason Bowman. I'm an underwriter by background. I'm a technology geek um, as well. So um, we have a nerd and a geek on the, uh, <laughs> on the webinar. Um, and I'm helping clients with uh, automating the writing process, which is how I've spent most of my career. Awesome. We're going to do a little bit of housekeeping for this session which is gonna be particularly important. So all participants here, you are in listen-only mode. Um, we will make this replay available after the webcast, uh, and I'm sure it will be so lively that you will want to listen to it over and over again. Um, you do have the ability to use the chat box to submit questions at any time. There will be multiple participant polls. You will be queued for those, but keep an eye out for them. This is a heavily interactive session. Uh, if you're tweeting in the back channel, there is a hashtag, and that is hashtag EXL look deeper. And again, please use that chat box if you have any technical difficulties as well um, or any problems pop up and your concerns will be addressed. So without further ado, let me describe the format of this session to you. We're actually going to be debating four of the hottest topics happening right now in the industry. Each debate is gonna be around 12 minutes long. It will include a judge and then two audience polls. So you will be prompted for a poll at the beginning of the debate, and then you will be prompted as the jury who is participating to weigh in on your final uh, your final decision on the topic. You will hear both defense and prosecution and their arguments from either side. And I do have to give a very strong warning here that the speakers on today's call may be taking positions that they do not necessarily agree with or reflect their views, but they wanna make sure that we are creating a powerful case because these are the exact debates that we are in on a regular basis. And sometimes you have to take the opposite of how you feel. So please don't hold anything against us, but of course we all hope we're gonna sway you to our own side as we make our arguments. With that, I'm going to hand over to our first esteemed judge, JR. Thank you, Nicole. So yes, I will be opening up case one and we will be starting the poll so you can vote whether you initially are for or against this position. So the life industry has been in a period of disruption for at least the past 10 years and all carriers out there are working on how to accelerate underwriting, looking at new data sources such as EHR and figuring out how they can automate their underwriting process. Uh, most people believe things were moving too slow and that COVID gave life underwriting a very big shot in the arm, no pun intended. Uh, but Nicole Myers, Ms. Myers is accused of making very irresponsible claims that the changes made due to COVID were reckless and companies should you know, cease and desist and revert to their traditional underwriting methods immediately. 
So in this trial, Jason Bowman will serve as our prosecution and Nicole will be defending her position. So go ahead and enter your poll, enter your belief. Was, was COVID, the changes due to COVID reckless or were they actually a much needed shot, shot in the arm? Vote yes if you think they were reckless. Okay, I will turn it over to Mr. Bowman now to pr prosecute his case. Thank you, it looks as though I already have nearly 90% of the audience in my favor, so how I can get up to 100, that's my challenge. Um, <laughs> so um, the pandemic has been obviously a huge challenge to the whole of society, um, and it's very easy for us to say, oh, we want to go back to how things were before. Um, you know, I think in many areas we have that in, in you know, our personal lives. But um, there's also things, if you think about maybe how your work life has changed, there's maybe things actually you don't want to go back. Um, and if you think of us as an industry, uh, think of where we were before COVID, a $12 trillion insurance gap, people not buying our products uh, as widely as we believe they should. Um, we had an outdated distribution model that didn't really appeal to the needs of a younger generation and a very cumbersome underwriting process that involved putting people through, uh, you know, invasive testing. Um, so we weren't in a great place. We were working on changes, but this has really accelerated the need for that. Um, and uh, so we've had to take some bold steps forward. <laughs> Uh, I would argue uh, the prosecution case here is that those steps were done prudently, they were done carefully. Carriers worked very well with reinsurers to make um, these changes. And so uh, I think the word reckless is uh, it's really appropriate <laughs> in this case. Um, you know, we now have a wealth of tools to help us assess risk more effectively uh, than we did 10 years ago. And uh, we're deploying those now and we're accelerating the use of them uh, in a very wise uh, manner. Uh, I think we found a better way of doing things. So I think companies that want to go back, um, you know, will really find that's a road to obscurity. That's not the future. And that's the that's the case of the prosecution. Ms. Myers. Thank you, Judge. You know, it's it's no one is denying that we did the best that we could, right? We absolutely made the best decisions that we were able to make with the data that we had at the time. But the statement here isn't stating that we made we made the best decisions we could at the time when we were in the middle of an absolute crisis and a pandemic and we were trying to keep business flowing through. The statement here, what we're bringing forward is that we actually don't have a good enough view in terms of the long tail to know if those decisions we made should be permanent or not. We don't know. And we need to be comfort with, comfortable in the unknown. We need to be able to take risks. That's the, that's the business that we're in, and that's who we are, and that's absolutely correct. But these changes that we've made, these broad, sweeping changes that we made, we don't know what, what the future is holding for those, and it could be extremely detrimental to the way that we do business. It's time to take a step back. It's time to ask ourselves the tough questions if we really think we have a complete view based on what we know and where we are to truly keep these changes, to keep changes in place that our models aren't even necessarily mature enough to be handling with fractured data sources that have been pulled in from various corners of the universe and stitched together into a patchwork to try and make these decisions. I mean, we're an industry that wants to make sure that we have comfort with what we do, right? Yes, we take risk. Absolutely, we take risk. But we could be putting ourselves at regulatory jeopardy. We could be setting ourselves up for all sorts of trouble in the future. And the only way to really get a handle on that is to hit pause right now, do what we know how to do, and then assess the way forward. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Now back to Mr. Bowman for his closing arguments. Yeah, I mean, I'd certainly, you know, I take the case that, uh, you know, it's early days. This is a long term business. It takes time for us to really know have we done the right thing. Um, so I'd, I'd certainly say let's monitor, let's, walk, you know, tread carefully. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of tools now. We have a lot of data analytics. We have the ability to check the pulse of our business so much more 
accurately than we did in the past when we just had to wait 10 years and see if we if the claims came in um so you know we've got ways of being able to monitor this we don't need to hit the stop button uh we can uh, we can just be careful we can watch watch and learn we can refine things i always think you know we need to to test and learn and improve as we go but um you know we've seen so many good steps forward in terms of customer engagement developing new products uh you know changing some of our products making them more sophisticated as well as all the the wealth of tools that we've deployed in underwriting um so all of that together i think puts us in a really strong position and you know we have to take the customer's perspective you know on this industry you know we're starting to see early signs from you know the mib data that came out this week of you know year on year uh, record growth uh you know customers are aware of their need for life insurance like they never have been before so um you know that's a, a wave that we need to ride and just going back and adding back all the invasive testing and everything that we used to do is going to kill that stone dead so now's the time for us to just move forward, move in the same direction, but monitor as we go. All right, Nicole, any closing arguments from the defense? Thank you. I think, uh, you know, we are simply not mature enough in our understanding of the situation. I stand by what I have said, that the decisions which were made were made under duress and decisions made under duress are rarely good decisions. We did what we had to do, but now is the time to stabilize. Yes, we protect our customer experience. Yes, we ride the wave, but we cannot put ourselves at jeopardy and risk. We cannot put the long-term viability of our industry at jeopardy and risk, and we need to think very critically about the reckless nature of what was done. Thank you. And thank you. That will conclude our case. So ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's now your turn to decide the final verdict. Has it have Nicole or Jason been able to sway your mind? So should we take a step back from all of the COVID related changes as Ms. Myers has opined, or is it time to take those learnings and move forward with pursuing new data and new underwriting approaches? Please enter your vote now. Now's a perfect time for a cat filter cameo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, hey, listen, I picked up 3% there. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Mr. Bowman still won the case, but you're right. That was, I'm impressed that you were able to pick up some additional votes. So congratulations on that. All it's right. This jury we have on the line today, tremendous. All right, I think it's time to move on to case two. Does somebody, uh, do you want me to just move into doing the opening for case two, Sandeep? Yep, absolutely. And I would just, I would note, Jennifer, that uh, Nicole got 30%, 33% increase on her side. So I think in some ways she proved herself not guilty there. <laughs> Good job, Nicole. <laughs> and Jason. <laughs> All right, case two. Um, and again, we're, uh, this, you'll be, have the opportunity to enter your vote. So many uh, underwriters see electronic health record data as being the holy grail for underwriting. I may have used that phrase a time or two myself. Uh, they're generally lower cost than traditional APSs and blood profiles. It's non-invasive, it's loaded with protective value and significantly faster than an APS. But I think many of us are disappointed with the, how fast our access to EHRs has grown. And in the interim, you know, and they also have, you know, requests for special authorizations or requiring customers to enter their credentials to access their patient portal data. So our defendant in this case is Ms. Myers, who again alleges that EHR is moving too slowly and that the industry should move away from the focus on EHR and instead should focus on predictive models that are becoming more and more prevalent in underwriting. She, she alleges that further that um, EHR will eventually rent, uh, will render the use of all medical records as obsolete. And uh, Sandeep will be leading the prosecution case against Ms. Myers and she will be defending her position. So please enter your vote now. Let's see if Nicole starts up behind again. <laughs> here to make a strong case. 
She loves it when the decks are stacked against her. I do. You, I like a challenge. We know this. Oh, no. 33% was fantastic. That was good. <laughs> all right. That's, oh, that's about a, a draw. So, all right. I think um, prosecution, Sandeep, you are up to prosecute Ms. Ms. Myers here. Okay. Um, well, I don't know if my Myers knows, but it, it costs a billion dollars to install an EHR system for a large provider network. And, and you know, it does take time to spend a billion dollars. Um, and, and I would say that in COVID times, just as we are innovating in the life industry, so are big changes happening in healthcare. So all these efforts, the EHR efforts have accelerated. I mean, you know, no longer is there an option to fax medical records to each other. It's a life and death situation. So, so we are seeing a huge implementation of EHRs. Uh, I mean, providers like Aetna, they've simplified accessing the EHR down to, to an app for providers. So, so we need to be ready to take that innovation because there is no more current and comprehensive source of medical information with a defined structure uh, that's available to us. And I think uh, everyone knows that. Uh, I mean, we have actually our teams converting historical APSs into EHR format. So we can actually model our prior underwriting decisions against current data. Uh, EHRs are absolutely going to be a force and it's accelerating because of COVID. Now, I would say that Ms. Myers is going to make arguments that, hey, you know, hit rates are 50, 60 percent. There are completeness issues. Uh, this information is not conducive to underwriting. But these are solvable problems. And, and which source does not have these problems? I would say that if we really need to go to fluidless underwriting, we need to have an EHR that reflects the most recent medical condition of the applicant. And, and the EHRs are the only way to, to provide that. Uh, I really think Ms. Myers needs to be a little patient. She needs to retract her EHR complaints um, and, and then go with the flow here. All right, over to Nicole to, to defend her position. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Sandeep says that it takes a while to spend a billion dollars. I can spend a billion dollars quite quickly, just for the record. I just want to start right there. Listen, <laughs> if we truly had 50 to 60 percent hit rates, we probably would feel better about that. But but the truth is, the rates, the, the EHR as defined hit rates, right? So true electronic health record information that's coming in, the hit rates aren't that high yet. And what we're seeing is clinical data, which is moving into this space, being integrated into these risk models in a manner that can be done very quickly at point of sale. This is a concern. Release rates and hit rates and overall coverage rates have not gotten to the place that we need them at. And if it's gonna take another two or three or four years to get us to a position where we have adequate coverage to actually integrate into those models and into automation, at that point, it's gonna jump the shark. We just don't have the time to wait. We don't have the time to stand still. And so while EHR is a rich data source, and you said yourself that we need to understand the most recent position, the most recent medical condition and the status, if we can get that information in other places and integrate it into models and do that in real time with much higher coverage rates, then we can get there. We can absolutely get there. What we need to think about is the change in underwriting philosophy. How do we shift from needing every last bit of information that might be contained in an EHR and thinking of it as an APS replacement to working with human in the loop models? We're working with quicker, easier to access data sources that give us a complete enough picture in order to make a decision. This, this, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is a philosophy shift in underwriting. This isn't about data and coverage. It's about the way that we approach the data that we have. And we have the data. Okay. I had to look up what jump the shark means. Uh, that was a new one, Nicole. Uh, but Mr. Manchanda, would you please respond to Nicole's case? You know, I really have to put on my distribution hat because, you know, Nicole's talking about clinical data, for example, claims, labs, and prescriptions coming from databases. And there is always a delay in these databases being updated. 
So I should probably organize a clickbait uh, digital ad that says, hey, you're waiting for biopsy results? Come, let me lock in your life insurance rate right now. That's what Ms. Myers insurance is going to be open to out there. And, you know, if she's talking about other models like wearable data uh, that she says are going to mature, we all know that unless that's everywhere, we're more likely to get the marathoner sharing that with us than the couch potato. So I don't know how Ms. Myers wants to propose we, we use the, the ancillary sources of data rather than the actual real current source of data, which is EHR. And why she thinks it's a substitute. To me, they complement each other. Okay, so if it's not 50, 60%, depending on the EHR source, you have 30, 40%. But that is still giving you the most current and structured information from the outset. Why wouldn't you add that to the model instead of start substituting out there? And then you look at high face value uh, policy. I mean, surely if you want fluidless underwriting, you want the most current information and EHR is your primary information, everything else is ancillary. And Nicole, no. back to you. To, oh, sorry. I, well, let me add one more thing over here. <laughs> and I think Just God, one more data, thing. One <laughs> is that, you know, I think clinical data is pretty much uh, in, in the same place as uh, as other data. There's HIPAA compliance already built in. But if she's starting to get into other sources of information to support her modeling, which she seems to be employing but not explicitly stating, you know, they, they are not at the party yet because they have to meet the review, edit, delete requirements, FCRA type requirements. That way EHR is already in. And of course, her, her clinical data is in already. But, uh, but Ms. Myers really needs to rethink this. Judge, this man was over time. I just want to say that first, but that's okay. I will stick, I will stick to my two minute allotted time to make my counter argument. I am on the side of distribution. I am absolutely on the side of distribution, so much so that I want to see them be successful by accessing the sources of information that they can get to quickly. You say that there's a delay in databases. I say that EHR is still a fractured landscape with issues with extraction and issues with usability and in issues with coverage. Are wearables perfect? Absolutely not. We know that wearables are far from perfect. We understand that, but we believe, we believe that these are not substitutes as you purport that they are that these are solid indicators that allow us to make decisions and that these models that are being developed are absolutely going to work. They're going to work. They are working now, that they are maturing faster and they are doing it around EHR. They are building around EHR while EHR is waiting to scale and waiting to get to where it needs to go. And this is just the cold, hard facts that Sandeep has to face in this case, that unfortunately the industry doesn't have time to wait another three plus years for a full record to be available. We need to make uh, decisions. Honorable Judge, I think that was two minutes for Nicole. Too. <laughs> I'm at one minute and 49 seconds and I will even conclude early. The floor is yours, Honorable Judge. All right, thank you very much, Sandeep and Nicole. Now it's up to the jury to decide. Let's go to our final poll. Should we continue pursuing, are, are, are EHRs the holy grail, and we should continue to pursue accessing as much medical information as we can, or instead should we focus on alternative data sources and predictive models? Please place your vote. really should have thought about Jeopardy music. This was 49 and right? <laughs> <laughs> it was 49 and 51 originally. Yes. So 33% increase here. Nicole should be at what, 65 or so? Oh my goodness, you won again. Six. All right, Nicole, remind me never to go up against you, okay? 
Um, <laughs> I look forward to my LinkedIn inbox blowing up after this webinar, by the way. <laughs> All right. Someone else is moving in to be the judge now. The Honorable Sandeep. <clears throat> All right. We have our statement number three. So um, we have some irresponsible statements being made out here uh, by Jason. What, what he is stating is that predictive models that we are actually espousing over here will increase regulatory scrutiny in such a way that it's going to take the industry back to, I would add, pre-COVID dark ages. Now, we know that the regulatory climate is, is very important. That's the reason why we have the state filings that we have to deal with. And, and I do agree that the squeaky wheel right now is more around privacy the causality in these models, the appropriateness of the models and how they're being designed rather than wider access of life insurance or customer experience out there. Uh, <clears throat> but to say that it's actually going to take us backwards uh, because we are modeling and, and dealing with the regulators, I think is a big, uh, big statement that he's making. And, and we have uh, <clears throat> Jennifer who is leading the prosecution against him uh, let's start with the poll first and see where the audience is and see who sways the jury. Okay. So, Jason, you're really um, coming out at 27, not as bad as Nicole in the first one, but you have a, have a long hill to climb. Um, to <laughs> I would say, Jennifer, you're the prosecution. The floor is yours. All right. Mr. Bowman's allegations are reactionary and reckless. There is a very real risk that his statements could take us back to the dark ages and reverse all the progress that we've made over the last few years with streamlining the underwriting process. When I rest my case, I am confident you will agree Mr. Bowman is sadly misinformed and that the use of predictive models is going to be a positive force for innovation and will produce positive public policy benefits. So the first use of predictive models for individual life insurance has been around since 2012, 2013. There were several carriers involved in introducing accelerated underwriting programs. And since then, the use of models has become you know, fairly ubiquitous, with most carriers having some form of accelerated underwriting. Uh, most of us see this as a positive trend, and that the life industry is certainly, was certainly in need of innovation, and the use of accelerated underwriting was one of the first innovations that I can remember for a very long time. Why is it important? Well, there is too many people in the US who are not insured. According to Limbra, Life insurance ownership is the lowest level in 50 years, and three in 10 households have no life insurance at all. And this really hits the middle market even the most uh, significantly because they have a higher need for life insurance, but they're less able to afford and have less access to buying life insurance. Why do they have less access? Because life insurance agents don't get paid a lot of money for small, selling smaller policies. So we need to find new ways to reach this vastly undersured underinsured middle market. Further, many customers avoid buying life insurance because, I mean, how many financial products do you have to stick out your arm and have put somebody put a needle in it to acquire a, a financial product? So finding new ways to underwrite, finding new data sources, using predictive models will help us to not only reach the middle class, the underinsured middle class, it'll also help us to do it in a more cost-effective manner and provide quality, competitive underwriting products, but that don't involve the onerous underwriting process of the past. Okay. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. JR, you went a little over time, so I'll have to take away some of your closing arguments time, but over <laughs> to you, Jay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to start off by making the statement, um, you know, predictive models have a role. And, uh, you know, the, the prosecution here is 
uh, sorry, the defence is not uh, trying to uh, undermine that. There is a role, but uh, the the use and the excessive use of predictive models in in making uh, final decisions on on underwriting cases is the the point of contention we have here. Um, and we have it on two grounds. One is these models are early in their development, um, and uh, they're still not necessarily fully reliable. Um, and I'll give you an example. I've reviewed cases, um, and you know, alongside uh, the, the results of predictive models. And one one case I saw just a few days ago was uh, somebody who's diabetic, have congestive heart failure, uh, they have hypertension, they have a BMI of 32, and the predictive model came back with a preferred decision. And this is a model built on tens of millions of lives of data. So there, there are there are gaps in these models. When you start slicing this data up, it becomes very thin in places. So overly reliant or being overly reliant on the models, I think it's it's nice just to get a score out, but we have to be careful. The other point of contention here is the, the regulatory concerns that this is just get attack, uh, attracting a lot of attention from regulators. Washington recently. Um, forbid the use of credit data for underwriting and insurance. Um, and we're just seeing more and more activity from regulators. We're all aware of the New York circular letter. Um, you know, this is just going to increase um, and it's going to not just impact the, the use of predictive models, it could impact the entire way that we underwrite uh, and threaten that altogether. So this is, this is the, uh, the case for the defense of this statement. All right, so the doom and gloom from Mr. Bauman. <laughs> uh, what do you have to say, JR? All right, thank you, Judge, and I will try to keep my remarks succinct. So I do appreciate Mr. Bowman's point of view. There are challenges with developing and using predictive models, but the key is not to scrap these innovative new techniques. The companies that succeed are those that find, bring together the right expertise and bring together people that can design the right products and distribution stat strategies paired with underwriting innovation. We need to understand what regulators' concerns are and, and use that information as we develop new processes for the future. So in December of 2020, there were more than 17,000 GoFundMe accounts to pay for funerals. We can and must do better than this. Innovation within the insurance industry is critical to helping all Americans become more financially secure and an important step, we need to put GoFundMe funerals out of business. Okay, so that, that's the prosecution's case. All right, uh, your closing comments, Mr. Bauman. Yeah, so uh, I wouldn't say I'm doom and gloom. I'd say I'm just, um, I'm blowing the whistle here just mm -hmm. on you know giving us the time to, to think and check what we're doing. Um, the recent AHOU meeting, we had a member of the NIIC presenting, uh, and these are the things they had concerns around with predictive models. Unlawful discrimination against protected classes, use of external data without proper consent, a lack of governance, control, peer pressure and documentation, a lack of consumer disclosure and transparency, and models that are based on correlation rather than causation. These are serious um, you know, concerns from the regulators that are now being voiced quite actively. As an industry, if we don't take these seriously, we're gonna have some nasty shots down, down the line. So I'm just flagging this up. You know, let's, let's talk about it. Let's work out a better way of working where we use these models um, selectively and we use them alongside traditional underwriting tools. Okay, thank you. So it looks like the, the defense's arguments is, is that the way our, we are approaching these models is, is headed backwards, and there is possibly a, other ways of approaching it that could move us forward. And I think the prosecution's argument is that in some ways we are already taking those, those approaches to move it forward, but it's for the jury to decide. So the poll is open again. Let's see if Jason comes out of his hole of, what was it, 2773? 2773. Dang. All right, good job, Jason. <laughs> oh, wow. 
Nice. 33%. Another one. Another Two winner more. there. He went up 33%. Mm -hmm. but 27%. The yeah, <laughs> doom and gloom has been convincing. Jason is our last honorable judge. Yes, thank you, Nicole. Um, so the fourth uh, and final uh, statement uh, is concerning the use of or the level of automation in the underwriting process. Uh, some technology experts have alleged that human underwriting as we know it will be is quickly becoming extinct. Uh, it's alleged by the defendant is making irresponsible statements that within five years will progress to where 90 percent of underwriting is completed by machines and only 10% still referred to a human underwriter. Uh, and when we talk about underwriting here, we're talking about fully underwritten business, not just sort of simplified issue. So uh, the question here is, um, you know, are, are we uh, gonna be putting a lot of underwriters out of work or moving them to other things and fully automating to a point where machines make 90% uh, of the decisions? So uh, we'll start off with the, uh, the, the audience poll. Uh, machine to human uh, ratio for underwriting will be 90-10 in five years. Do you agree? Now, once you voted, we'll be um, inviting uh, Mr. Manchandra to make the case for the prosecution. So 38% uh, believe that uh, that is a correct number, and 62%. So you've got a bit of a battle on your hands, Sandy. Well, or actually, I'm the, I'm the prosecution. Yeah, Jennifer. <laughs> but I think I'm coming out ahead. Okay, you you can make your your uh, your case now. Bring it uh, on. No, no. You know, the fact is, listen. Will there be more automation? Of course, there will be. Will we have more predictive models? Of course, right? The point is, will there be, will machines drive 90% of the decisions? Absolutely not. I mean, if, I was just looking, so, uh, looking at the back of the envelope estimates, right? 20 million policies every year, maybe 10 million likely individual. Most of them, of course, are simplified guarantee issue, to do a 20 rule, um, uh, maybe 10, maybe 2 million are fully underwritten. Uh, even though they may represent 80% of the premium. But really, for these 2 million, you know, uh, fully underwritten policies to go down to 200K in five years, it, it just just doesn't you know, ring true there. I mean, I could, even even 600K, which is like a 70-30 split, would be a stretch, but I could I could go with that. Um, I mean, we, we, we're working with simplified issue clients, and they want 10 to 20% review just to make sure everything is okay. And then, and then there's appeals out there. Now, I'd say if if cost was a primary driver for, for underwriting, I mean, it is a big driver, but that's not the primary driver, right? What is the primary driver? We want growth in new segments and products. We want to deliver new customer experiences to address that, that insurance gap out there. We want better risk assessment, you know, along with managing the anti-selection from these new methods of underwriting. So, Without cost being a single-minded focus, I don't see us getting to 90-10. Um, the, the other example I'll cite is, you know, almost half of our business at EXL is analytics. So we're in the business of automating processes, putting automated decisioning there. But when you want 100% accuracy, like, you know, we're not going to reduce our, our, our standards of accuracy for underwriting decisions, like 99 plus close to 100. I mean, that's 100 times harder than 98, 99% accuracy. 70% uh, is generally our target because you need the human intervention to make sure your structured data you're putting out is validated, your decisions are validated. So it's just completely irresponsible for JR to make these statements. If she is guilty and changes her number to 70%, maybe I can ask for a reduced sentence for her. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Um, Ms. Richards, you uh, you have to uh, an opportunity to counter some of those uh, statements that you're being uh, reckless in uh, in talking about a 90-10 split. Piece of cake. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Mr. Sandeep is trying to convince you that the insurance industry ability to innovate is woefully lacking. 
The first rules engines for life underwriting emerged in the mid-1990s. I had the pleasure working with Lincoln National's first LUS underwriting system. And my company got to 30% of cases, 100% auto decisioned, and of those cases, they were also 100% auto issued. So do we really believe that 25 years later, we can't get to 90% of our underwriting decisions? Mr. Sandeep's uh, allegations are ludicrous and dangerous to the long-term health of the industry. Full underwriting, most carriers are able to get to 90% of their applicants issued at standard, standard or better rates. By definition, if you're standard, the case isn't that complex. And when you add in simplified issue products, virtually 100% of those decisions could be automated. In the early days of automated underwriting, the biggest impediment that we faced was a lack of structured data. We started out with clerks manually entering all of the data on the application that was you know, completed on a piece of paper by the agent. But today, virtually all of our underwriting data sources are available as structured data. Almost every carrier has an e-app or a tele-app and then prescription records, MBRs are fully structured. The only major exception is APSs, and with the advent of the EHR and some of the other new tools that are available, we're even starting to break down that impediment. We have the technology to automate 90% of the cases. Now we just need to apply our ingenuity and new ways of thinking to the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I'm gonna hand back to uh, Sandeep to uh, counter any of those uh, points from Jennifer. Um, now, you know, I I have to say that I, I think I am on the side of innovation too, JR. And, but I'm also thinking a little deeply about the future of underwriting. Uh, I'd say yes, you know, a, a lot of the business today is, is preferred or, uh, you know, uh, normal. Uh, I, I'd say, but the future will be very different. Um, I'd say once we start using these models, even when we get to 70-30 uh, ratio that I'm talking about, we're going to have new reasons for referrals to deal with. I mean, we're going to have, we're going to create anti-selection flag trigger, right? You create a model to create that. Well, somebody has to review it and somebody has to make sure that the machine output is accurate and, and, and we improve it over time. I mean, you just look at, we have random holdouts today to check our underwriting decisions. I would say we would probably have in this scenario, we would probably need 10%, you know, to set aside for referrals um, to do our random holdout analysis as we do today. Um, even converting, you talked about unstructured information to structure, right? We, we do that for a living. And the amount of, uh, you know, human effort that's involved initially and over time, there's always human mm -hmm. effort involved to make sure that the data you're creating out of the unstructured information is accurate and appropriate for modeling. So that itself is going to create some referrals out of it and not just go through the automated decisioning engine. Uh, I mean, I also see other things happening. You know, we care about customer experience. Sometimes you just have to, you may even need underwriters have to explain the decision better to the applicant as to why their risk rating is what it is. Um, I can also see lots of auto declines today for certain impairments changing in the future. And, and we won't have enough data for machine learning models to auto decision those. So that's gonna go to an underwriter. So lots of cases, you know, if you really think to the future, of working on new ways of underwriting, innovating. It also comes up with new reasons for referrals to keep profitability intact, to keep the customer experience intact. So, so I'd say the carriers and, you know, we all need to work uh, on retaining our underwriting talent and we need to provide opportunities to change and, and evolve the talent with more analytical skills because machines may initiate 100% of the decisions in five years. But the human ratio, machine ratio, in my opinion, will be more like 70-30 as the human involvement becomes more sophisticated, more productive, because that's what we'll have to do to ensure product prof uh, portfolio profitability. Uh, and, and I think JR just needs to stop this charade of 90-10 uh, or, or we'll, or I'm, I'm at least going to ask for, for some kind of punishment over here. You know, maybe maybe <laughs> okay, it's just okay, your community okay, service at the OA or something. You're in risk of the punishment for going way over your two minutes, so uh, I will uh, give a little more leeway to uh, the defense in their closing statements. Thank you, Judge. 
So just want to throw in there. Did I mention that I work for a company that's 100% instant issue? All right. <laughs> With all due respect to my worthy opponent, I believe his arguments have completely missed the point. I never alleged we wouldn't need talented underwriters and we didn't re need to retain our underwriting talent. What I alleged is that because of the work by those talented underwriters paired with actuaries, data scientists, and engineers, we will advance our automated underwriting decisions to the point where 90% of applications are underwritten without human intervention. We'll still need that multifunctional team, including all of those underwriters that are going to develop new skills to help us dream up better ways of doing things. So there are still plenty of opportunities for underwriters to be part of the solution. They just won't be chained to a desk with an inbox and an outbox. So to open my or to echo my opponent's opening arguments, will there be automation? Yes. Will there be predictive models? Yes. Will automation drive 90% of underwriting decisions within the next five years? A resounding absolutely yes. So now I need to bring my final statements to the close, uh, but it's time for me to contact my attorney because I think I have a good case against Mr. Manchanda for defamation. Sandeep, I will see you in court. <laughs> Let's see who wins. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks for both of those impassioned uh, pleas. And um, I think the trajectory clearly here is towards automation. I think both sides would agree that. I think the question mark is really over the speed of that change. So uh, members of the jury, that's a decision that you uh, can now make. Do you believe in that five-year period we will be uh, at the 90-10 mark? Please uh, go ahead and register your votes now. I think we're going to need to do one of these in person. What do you guys think? <laughs> Yay, that's a good idea. With, with the wigs as well. Yes, wigs and robes. <laughs> Aha, so we have a slight increase in the case four from, I think, was it 37? Uh, 38. Oh, 38. Oh, Jim, convinced at least 5%. She has a 5% uptick. Jennifer, you <laughs> the audience. Well done, to the jury. The jury is with JR. Excellent. Back to you, Nicole. Yeah, so compelling arguments all the way around. We, we, we really talked about some tough problems that are happening in the industry today, right? And I said at the beginning that, that you would be hearing arguments on either side that individuals may not necessarily agree with. But we know these topics well enough that we understand what it's like to have to really debate what's happening, right? The four statements that we, we dug into, the COVID-related changes was the first one. You know, what is the impact of those COVID-related changes that we, we made? What are the pros? What are the cons? Um, we moved from uh, 11 to 89 percent yay and nays to 14 and 86 percent on the yay and nay. Um, for the second statement, we talked about EHRs and whether or not they're maturing essentially at a rate that is fast enough. Um, and, we, and we went from 49% uh, yay, 51% nay to 54-46 there. Um, the predictive model and regulatory scrutiny, again, another very hotly debated topic. Um, we went from 27% yay to, and 73% nay to 35-65. So uh, again, uh, some movement in those opinions. And with this most recent uh, one that we just covered around the machine to human ratio, we saw we saw 2% come over to that yay. So 38.62 to 40.60. Very passionate arguments today. This was a ton of fun for us to put together. I again apologize that unfortunately we had a technical difficulty which would not allow our cameras to be on. I'm sure you would have seen a lot of hand waving and passionate facial expressions and probably the occasional live cat cameo because there's always one roaming around in my house I know um, but it was a pleasure to be here with the jury today I don't believe we have any questions in um, in the chat window yeah, no I don't I didn't think I saw any so uh, we will uh, you know I would just add that this is something that Nicole I think we can we can repeat in a few months the next three or four topics 
and bring them to court. Uh, what do you think? I think it's a great idea. And I would also welcome, you know, if anyone who's participated on this panel today has ideas that they have been debating in their organizations that they would like to hear us debate, I'm sure we would be open to that as well. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. Uh, so thank you, Nicole, for, for hosting it as well. Uh, I think we can uh, pass it on to Mary Beth. You can bring out your sponsor message and, uh, and we can close it. Thank you all for participating and being a fantastic quiet audience. <laughs>